Well, good morning, church, and happy Resurrection Sunday. I hear a lot of He, he is Risen's going on over there, so that's good news. You're in the right place. Well, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We're so glad you chose to join us this morning in celebration of our Lord, that He is alive. And if you've been with us before, it's still great to see you again, and we have reason to sing and celebrate this morning. Of all the days we gather, this is the greatest, the day we celebrate our living God who has defeated death. Amen. Would you turn with me to the Gospel of John? That's where we'll be this morning as we look back at this story that took place. John chapter 20, we're going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 20, and here's what we read. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed." For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Would you join me in prayer this morning? God, we approach your word this morning humbly. Recognizing that just as you are the true and living God, your word is living, active, and powerful. And Lord, we come before it, we submit to it, we trust it as truth. Lord, we receive it as truth, and we pray that you would speak to your people this morning. Lord, as we continue our celebration of praise and worship through the studying of your word, would your spirit speak now through your word? Would you prick our hearts? Would you increase our affections for you? Would you stir up our love and understanding of you? And God, would you be glorified, magnified, and praised today? And it's in your name, Jesus, the living God, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it was around 47 B.C. when Julius Caesar would write a letter back to the Roman Senate of his success in battle. And in that letter that he would write to them, giving account of his decisive victory over the enemy, of totally conquering and defeating those who came against him, within that letter, he would write these three words, Vini, Vidi, Vici, in Latin, these three words that make up the phrase, I came... I saw, I conquered. Well, today what we get to celebrate, today what we gather together to sing and to proclaim is that we serve a God who has come, who has seen the effects of sin, a lost people in need of a Savior, like sheep without a shepherd. He came and He walked among us and He saw our need our fallen stature, and no way to save ourselves, and he came and he conquered death. He defeated death on the cross, and he overcame even sin 
and the grave. And so we come together today to celebrate our God who has come, who has seen, and who has conquered. Amen? But our story doesn't begin there. Our story begins with Mary Magdalene on the first day of the week, a Sunday morning, approaching the tomb. This would have followed what we celebrate as Good Friday, but would have been the worst Friday for a follower of Jesus that had ever existed. A Friday that they would watch their rabbi, their Messiah, the one they had given up everything to follow, die upon a cross right before their eyes. And we don't find them all standing loyally by his side. They have all ran away and departed in fear. This would have been followed by the Sabbath Sunday, a silent day in their homes where they are hiding out and still scared for their life, where they are mourning and weeping the loss of Jesus. But a Sunday morning comes, we find Mary, the other Gospels, let us know that she wasn't by herself approaching the tomb. Mary is the one we get mention of here, Mary Magdalene, now a follower of Jesus, and that is what we know her for, but her previous life wasn't so. She was a woman that had to have seven demons cast out of her before she came to Jesus. She was from the town of Magda, hence the name Mary Magdalene, a town that was known for prostitution. In fact, many summarized because of this that most likely that would have been the practice and the trade that Mary would have known before Jesus. But the beauty is, in Jesus, all those things are washed away. So that the woman we read about in John chapter 20 is not the woman of Magda, the, the place of prostitution, or the demon-possessed woman that Jesus brought out of that. We just read of Mary the follower of Jesus, the faithful one to get up and approach that tomb while it was still dark. And do you see the beauty in that truth? Do you celebrate the fact that in Jesus, whatever your story may have been, whatever wrongs you may have identified with, when you come to Jesus, you get a new name and a new identity. That old things have passed away and all things are new. That's not who you are anymore. And that's not how God sees you because of Jesus' work on the cross. You have been washed. You have been cleansed. He sees you as perfect and holy because as Jesus said in his final breaths, it is finished. The work is complete. We celebrate a resurrection today, but that is not a resurrection of your old man and your old life. That life remains dead in the tomb, but there is a new life, an abundant life, Jesus would say, the resurrection life that we get to celebrate and experience each and every day because of this moment. Now, she approaches the tomb early while it was still dark. This would have been the fourth watch between 3 and 6 a.m. So for all of you that struggled to get to the sunrise service, Mary one-upped us here, okay? Between 3 and 6 a.m., she is up early while it is dark, approaching the tomb. This is the bold act of a woman who has been profoundly transformed by Jesus. In fact, as you read the other gospel accounts, as she's approaching the tomb with these other ladies, they're discussing amongst themselves, what are we going to do about that rock? Because as they would have placed Jesus into that tomb, they would have rolled this rock in front of the doorway. And this is no small rock. This is a multi-ton stone that is placed in a groove and rolled down at a slant so that it locks into place right there. This took multiple men, we read, just to move into place. And now we're talking about trying to roll it up the hill to get it out of the way so they can continue this process of bringing these different oils and ointments for Jesus' proper burial. 
But they're returning to this tomb, not knowing fully how they will solve that problem, but knowing they have to go. And isn't that the way that love works? That sometimes it doesn't really make sense, and it may not be the most logical decision, but you're just motivated by this love, and you have to do something. And so they are up, and they are going towards that tomb, confident, we will figure something out, but let's go. And as they come to the tomb, they find something puzzling, which is interesting because isn't this the very solution to their problem? The stone is rolled away. You can get in. And yet they're puzzled by this because they weren't expecting that. This was no minor thing to have happen. And she immediately comes to the conclusion, robbers. Robbers have done this. They have rolled away the stone and they have taken the body of our Lord. And this wasn't out of the realm of possibility. It was quite common in this time for grave robbers to to sneak into a tomb in the night, to take anything of value that would have been left there. In fact, it got so bad that the emperor Claudius had actually outlawed breaking into tombs, robbing the graves of the dead to the point that he had made it a capital sentence. That if you were caught breaking into a tomb or into a grave and stealing something, it was your life as penalty for that act. So whoever it may be, even the great Indiana Jones himself, if you're caught breaking into the tomb of someone, it was your head. And here, when she comes upon the scene, she is distraught. She is overwhelmed because this is where my Messiah was laid. I was here when they closed the door, and he's gone. He's no longer there, and they depart. And she runs because that's the right response. And she finds Simon Peter and the other disciple. We know this to be John, the one who Jesus loved. And although this is a wrong conclusion she's come to, saying someone has taken the body and we don't know where they've laid it, Mary, the reality is no one has taken the body and he's not laying anywhere. But she comes to the disciples distraught, not knowing what to do, letting them know what she's come upon, trying to make sense of everything that's happened. And we read that Peter therefore went out and the other disciple And they were going to the tomb, and they both ran together. The other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Now, Luke's gospel gives us the first reaction of the disciples when the ladies returned, that it was like idle tales, too good to be true. Oh, it was early in the morning. You guys are emotional. You don't know what you saw. Surely that can't be true. We've taken hundreds, if not thousands of people to their tomb. Nobody's gone in the morning. And nobody could have rolled that stone away. It was guarded by soldiers. It had a seal upon it. Nobody would have dared. It seemed beyond belief for the disciples. And I find comfort in this. That these great men of God who had walked with Jesus and had been told repeatedly that this would take place are struggling to believe it in this moment, that it could be true. No matter how badly they wanted it to be, they were wrestling with it. Do you wrestle with guilt at times? Believing the things you read in Scripture to be true, struggling to comprehend how something that you read within the Word could possibly take place. Take heart this morning that you are not alone. The very men that God would use to build the church and spread the gospel wrestled with belief in this moment. But here's the catch. You see, Peter and John, even as they wrestled, They ran to the tomb. 
even as crazy and as outlandish as it may have sounded, even as convinced as they may have been that Mary saw something that wasn't true, that they were mistaken, they were going to go and see for themselves. They were not about to let doubt derail their faith. Instead, like we see in Thomas's account, account Jesus invites that doubt and says, come to me with it. I can handle it. And they run. In a world of deconstructionism, where you are encouraged to embrace your doubts and cast off your beliefs, bring your doubts to the God of truth. Wrestle in His presence with them and allow those doubts to take you to a deeper Faith, because as Peter and John run to Jesus with their doubts, they will come to find Jesus in a way they have never seen him before. But this doesn't come if they run away. No, instead they run to him. And it's worth noting that this section we are reading this morning is the only time in the entire New Testament that you will see literal running taking place. Now, we read of running as an illustration of our faith, right? This great race of faith. Paul himself would say that he has run the race and kept the faith. But never do we see someone literally running within Scripture except for this moment here. Now, this isn't your biblical excuse to neglect running, so throw that out the door right now. But I do think it speaks to something important in this moment that we need to note. Because running implies urgency. There's a serious about whatever it is you are running to or running from when you are running. You don't walk away from a bear that's trying to maul you. Well, at least you don't more than once, I'll tell you that. You run. In the same way that in sports, you don't see a man running to steal a base, excuse me, walking to steal a base. If he's not running, he's going to be out. You don't see a football player be given the ball and then just kind of stroll his way right down that goal line. No, players that do that belong in one place and it's on the bench, not on the field. And I'd be willing to bet that if you have kids and if you have taken them to the most magical place in the world in their eyes, Disneyland, that what you had to tell them constantly was not speed up, but slow down. You see, when we're serious about something, we run. And no matter how crazy it may have sounded to Peter and John, They're going to run to see if their God is alive. That's not something you walk to go find out. In the same way, the invitation this morning as we sang was not to quietly under your breath hum the words if you know them, but to sing and shout them out because if they're true, they're worth shouting out at the top of your lungs. And if it is true that Jesus is alive... It's worth running for. In Peter's case, it's even worth losing the race to get there for, to see if Jesus is alive. And John, the competitor that he is, felt it absolutely essential that he mentions here that we both ran to the tomb, but I outran Peter. And he mentions it multiple times. Just make note, I was the first one there. And as the first one to approach the tomb, let me tell you what I saw. And as he stooped down, John, looking in, he sees the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. He finds the stone rolled away just as Mary has said, And then he sees the linen cloths, but it's interesting, why did John not go into the tomb? It wasn't that he didn't care about Jesus. He continues to describe himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. He cared deeply about Jesus. 
And there's many suggestions as to why he may not have approached the tomb and entered in that day. Some say it's due to the risk of a ceremonial defilement. If he was to go in and be caught by a dead body handling it, and so he stayed outside. Others say in light of the way John always describes himself, the one whom Jesus loved, that he wanted to respect the burial place of Jesus, so he did not enter. And some still would would argue that perhaps what John is doing is that just from a glance, he sees everything he needs to see. The door is open. The linen cloths are lying there. Clearly, Jesus isn't in the tomb. He doesn't need to enter it. There's no further need of investigation. Well, whatever the reason, we see a very different response from Peter, don't we? We read, then Simon Peter came following him and went right into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lined with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Now, this is true of Peter's track record throughout all of Scripture. Peter doesn't give a lot of thought into these things. He comes and the doors open and he is full speed inside. This is the same disciple that would be on a boat and say, hey, if that's you out there, Jesus, let me come out to you on the water. Peter's not one to kick back and stay away. He's one that always wants to enter into the moment. He's got some serious FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. He's got to be a part of what's going on. He's also the one that was quick to jump in the garden and chop off an ear of a soldier. It's not always to his benefit, but this is who Peter is through and through. He's the guy that jumps in all the way, right away. The same disciple that tried to rebuke Jesus once when Jesus said, I'm going to die. And Peter says, can we talk about that for a minute? Come here, Jesus. Let me... I think I've got a better plan here, okay? You're going to rule. You're not going to die, okay? We're going to rule and reign together. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. But he's also the one when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Stepped forward. said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And in this moment, Peter runs straight into that tomb. John may have beat me to the tomb, but I'm going to beat him inside the tomb. And he runs in. And it's important to note that these cloths are lying undisturbed, as the original language would tell us. Why is this important to note? It tells us two things very clearly. One, that Jesus' body was not stolen by robbers. Because what robbers do you know that sneak in and go to grab the body and decide, well, let's carefully unravel this, let's make sure we don't damage the cloth, and let's take the body and get out of here. But secondly, what many have heard, the the swoon theory, that Jesus was not really dead. He was only unconscious. And as they placed him in the tomb, the cool of the night woke him up. And he woke up and he took off the linen cloths and lied them there and escaped. There are so many things wrong with this theory. First of all, the fact that there was no way he could have rolled away the stone. But secondly, you have to realize these linen cloths that are wrapped around him as the ointments were placed on them, it would have formed like a cocoon around him. It would have become a hard, solid substance. So the only way Jesus is getting out of these wraps is if we, do, we see something taking place like on the movie Alien, right? Where there's just this breaking out from the chest and ripping these things apart to get out of them. There would have been a mess of clothes, cloths lying everywhere on the ground, it would have been very clear and very evident what took place. But that's not how they find it. They find it laying there, undisturbed, as if the body has just disappeared from within the linen cloths. But one more thing that you don't want to miss And I'm going to read it again for you because this description of the handkerchief around his head gets a special note, and there's a reason for it. It says that they find it not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. So even though we see Jesus pass right through the linen cloths, 
and leave them lying there undisturbed in their place, he took the time to fold the handkerchief that was around his head. Has this ever stuck out to you before? Because John gives incredible detail to this handkerchief. And if you're like me, you're like, John, get back to the point of the story. It's about Jesus. Why are you so focused on the handkerchief? Well, let me tell you why. What you need to understand is that there was a Jewish custom that as you entered a home and came over to a person's house for a meal, if they were nice, if they were kind and hospitable to you and treated you favorably and you enjoyed the meal, then as a guest, what you would do is you would take the piece of cloth, the the linen napkin that they would have given you, and you would have crumpled it up and placed it on your plate or the platter. This would have been a sign of saying, like, I enjoyed myself. This was a great stay. You were a very hospitable guest. Don't try this here. It doesn't translate well. But for them, that clearly was what it spoke to. But if you were not treated with kindness and hospitality, you would politely fold that napkin And it was the kindest way of you saying, I'm not ever coming back here. It was the nicest way that you could say thanks, but no thanks, goodbye. And as they approach the tomb of Jesus, how do they find the handkerchief that was wrapped around his head? But Jesus said, thanks tomb, it was a nice stay, but I'm not coming back here anymore, goodbye. Jesus may have gone in the tomb for a night, but he's finished with that. Death no longer has the final say. Jesus has resurrected and says, I'm not coming back to this tomb. Disciples, take note of the folded handkerchief laying by itself. Don't miss that because I'm not going to come back to a tomb to die again. It's over. It is finished. You can go to the tomb today, or at least what they claim to be the tomb, but you will not find Jesus there. As the angel proclaims, he is risen. Now, there's three words we need to note here. In English, we get the same word multiple times, and it's this word, saw. Mary came to the tomb, and she saw that the stone was rolled away. John got there first, and he saw the linen cloths. Then Peter enters the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths and the folded handkerchief. And then John comes into the tomb, and he saw and believed. We get the same word over and over and over again. But in the original language, there are three different words used here. As John first approached and saw the linen cloths lying there in verse Four, excuse me, verse five. It's the same word used when Mary had approached the tomb, and it's the the word blepo, and it just means to notice. You just notice it. You just take note of it as you approach. You immediately see it. Oh, look at that. Interesting. But then when Peter comes running right into that tomb, and he looks, and he sees in verse six, it is the word theoreo. It's actually where we get our word theater, and it speaks to a study and contemplation of what you see. In a movie, you're not just noticing, but you're thinking about, oh, what's going on here? What did I just see happen in this? Ooh, what do you think that guy's going to do? There's a contemplation taking place. Peter enters, and he knows something's going on here. There's the folded handkerchief. There's the linen cloth lying that the, the stones rolled away. He's He's contemplating, but he doesn't understand. And then the word we read in verse 8, as John enters that place, as he sees and believes, it's the word idon, and it means to see with comprehension and understanding. You see, many people came and saw. Some noticed. Peter observed But John, in this moment, as he enters into that tomb and he sees the cloths and that folded handkerchief, he sees with comprehension and understanding. He comes and he notes and he remembers and goes, wait a second. 
folded handkerchief, the linen cloths lying there, the tomb that's rolled away, and he believes. We read. Many people have come to church. Many people have approached the Word. Many people have pursued where they believe Jesus to be, and some have just taken notice of it. Oh, it seems like this guy did something. He was somebody, and they just leave it at noticing. Others have come and approached Jesus and His words and His life, and they, they contemplate it. They think upon it. This is interesting. This guy, Jesus, was definitely different. There's something about him, but I can't quite put my finger on it until the moment the Holy Spirit draws you to him, opens your eyes, and like John here, you see with an understanding and a comprehension. Like the day that the Father in heaven revealed to Peter, no, 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 you're not just a rabbi. You are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God. He says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. In this moment, John sees the very th same thing that Peter sees, that Mary saw, but he sees and he believes. You know, when we see Mary at this tomb, we see the, in the angel of the Lord in Matthew 28, 6 give an invitation Matthew 28, 6, it says this, Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. Come and see. Come and look for yourself. Come, all who are weary and heavy laden. Come with your questions. Come with your doubts. Come with your fears and your concerns. Bring it all and come to Jesus. And as you come, see. See the place where he lay. See the evidence that is clearly laid before you. See Jesus as he is. See him clearly for who he claimed to be and demonstrated himself to be. Come and see. But don't stop there. As you come and as you see and as like John, you believe then there is a response to go and tell. Many people approached the tomb that day, but just like Jesus, they didn't stay there. Mary came and she ran away, and the disciples run there, and then they run back, and everybody is approaching it, coming and seeing, but then there is a going and telling. In fact, even as Jesus would reveal himself to them, as he would appear in that room, and when they're terrified, he would say, peace, be still. They would come to him and see his wounds. He would invite Thomas to come and feel his hands and his side. He would eat a meal with them. But as they come and see, then he would tell them, now you need to go and tell the Great Commission. Now you need to go out because you have the greatest news in all of history. And people don't know it. So he doesn't say, come and see and believe and sit and stay. But come and see and then go and tell. See where he lay. See the evidence of his power. See the truth that can set you free. Just as the psalmist would put it, come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doing toward the sons of men. We come today to see within his word the truth that we have experienced in our hearts, that God is alive, that he is in control, and that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives within us. We have come to see and believe this to be true. And as we believe as John did, that Jesus has conquered death, that he has conquered sin, that he has conquered the enemy and offers life and victory to all who believe in him, the invitation we read at the end of this chapter, verses 30 and 31, is this. 
And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. And when we believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and experience that life, that abundant life in his name, Paul tells us, now who are in Christ Jesus, in Romans chapter 8, that just as Jesus is a conqueror over sin and death, when we join in him, it says this, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. What we come to celebrate today is that Jesus came to earth to dwell among us. He is our Emmanuel, God with us. But as he came, he saw us as a people lost, and he saw the need for a Savior, and he looked upon us in love and compassion and grace. And he demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came, he saw, and he conquered so that we can come and see the place where he lay and believe as John did and be more than conquerors in Christ Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us. That is good news today, church. But as I invite the worship team to come back up, because the only right way to respond to this is in praise and worship to our living God, I want to give an invitation. Because I'm willing to bet that there are people in this room, and maybe for years, maybe this is the first time, but you are coming and you are seeing there's something to this Jesus. I expected to come to hear about a dead man and hear his story. But what I'm hearing about is a God that's not dead, who is very much alive, and who offers eternal life to me through his finished work. And the only right response as you come and you see is what John displayed to us, that you would believe. And it doesn't take the rest of your life to earn it. You couldn't do anything to deserve it. Scripture makes clear all that we do as we come to Jesus and see him for who he is. The perfect spotless son of God that came to take away the sins of the world is we confess with our mouth. We'll confess what? That Jesus is Lord, that he is exactly who he said he was. And that I am a sinner, lost in my sin, dead in my trespasses, and cannot make my way to heaven. I need Jesus' life, and death to count for me. We confess with our mouth, but then we believe in our heart because we are saved by grace through faith. And Scripture makes it clear. There's no question about it. If you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart, you will be saved. Not someday, some way, now in this moment, you can receive salvation and that finished work of Jesus on the cross can be your payment for your sin. And his resurrection on that third day can be your resurrected life as you join in the family of God, as your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you join us proclaiming God, Jesus the resurrected one, the way, the truth, and the life because nobody comes to the Father except through him. If that's you this morning, I want to ask you to raise your hand where you are at because we want to pray for you. We want to pray alongside you and we want to welcome you into the family of God. If that is you, raise your hand in this moment. Hallelujah. Anybody else? Praise God. Can you give her a hand? 
Anybody else this morning? Praise God. I see you right here. Anyone else? This is the day of salvation. Don't put off for tomorrow what God's calling you to do today. In this last moment, praise God. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Well, praise God. We want to celebrate with the three of you. We want to pray alongside you. Would you join me in praying for our new family in the body of Christ? Lord, we thank you that you are the God who saves God, that these three people who came here today, just as John, they have come and they have seen and now they believe. And God, in this moment, your word tells us that they are brought from death to life, that they are taken from the power of darkness and conveyed into your kingdom of light, that they are forgiven of their sins like Mary, their old life is over. And they are a new creation in Christ Jesus with a new identity, a new purpose, a new hope, a living hope. That just as you rose three days later from the grave, that death is not the end of their story. That there is an eternal life with you in heaven prepared for them because of their confession, because of your finished work on the cross. Hallelujah, Lord. We celebrate that you are the God who is alive. The God who was once far off but has been brought near and has torn the veil and invites us into your throne room of grace. Lord, as we close in this song of worship, And praise, I pray that you would be glorified. That we would celebrate the way that you draw to yourself and save to the uttermost. You are the God who saves, and we worship you in this time. And all God's people said, Amen. He is risen. He is risen. risen Amen. Well, as we close out this morning's time of celebrating together that truth, we don't want you to leave without an invitation to come back. Next week, we're going to be jumping into a series on what it looks like to follow in the way of Jesus the ways in which he's called us to live, the practices he's called us to put on that we might represent him in a way that glorifies him. Please join us next week as we begin that. There's a new reading plan. If you've never read a Bible before, if you don't have a Bible, come tell us. Take the one in your pew. Put your name in it. It's yours. And if you don't know where to start, there's a reading plan out there that we've been going through. We're continuing to go through together. Grab one on your way out. If you're wondering how you can get connected, how you can continue to meet and gather and study and grow, there are cards out in the lobby. Grab one. It'll tell you ways you can get connected to remain within the body of Christ. And there's also a welcome card because we want to get to know you. You know, in the family of God, we better get to know each other and get along because we're going to spend eternity together. We might as well start now. So don't hesitate. Grab one of those cards out there. Fill it out. We'd love to get to know you better. But as you go today, may we go in the same way the angel told Mary. We come and we see. We've experienced this morning that he is a God who saves and redeems and has eternal life for us. Now let's go out there and tell. Go tell the story of what God has done in your life and what he can do for others because you have the message of living hope to a world that needs to hear it. Let's go in his power and let's tell his message 
of hope. Amen? Amen. We'll see you guys next week.